Dude, we are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Seamus and not sure this is a great idea. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, the former Labour MP for Worcester from 1997 until 2010, and the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State at the Department for International Development between 2008 and 2010, Michael Foster. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Hi, yeah, good to be here, Will. Um, so, to begin with, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask, as someone who has been uh, a member of Parliament for uh, previously a member of parliament for a considerable amount of time uh, how what are your general impressions of this general election campaign so far oh uh, they're very mixed i have to be honest i uh, i must admit i think it is a, a brave decision and and by that i'm talking sort of yes minister definition of brave to hold a general election in december um i think it's crazy personally <laughs> Um, because the weather um, may well determine um, the turnout uh, at the election. And we only have to go back two years when we were snowed in um, around that same date in December in 2017. So uh, it would be you know, a catastrophe for democracy if there was a downpour of uh, snow. And I've looked at my weather app today and snow is forecast both for Thursday and Friday of next week. So it's not looking promising around turnout. So that's the first observation to make. I think it's it, we could have a lower turnout than normal. Um, the second observation really is uh, it's it's because of the nature of the you know when the election is held, it's very difficult for people, uh, campaigners that is, to actually make contact with people. Mm. Um, it, normally, elections in May or June, you've got long evenings. And as you know, as a campaigner and as you know, a resident, having someone knock the door at half six, seven o'clock at night, it's light, it's hopefully warm. That's not a hardship. Hmm. Um, it's very difficult to a get people motivated to knock doors at seven o'clock at night in the middle of winter. Even more difficult to get people to open the doors to talk to hmm. you yeah. at that, that time of night. So, I think the nature of the campaign is probably probably less reliant upon those doorstep conversations than it has been in the past. And I'm not sure that's a good thing either, because it's, it's actually quite good for candidates, whatever party they are, to um, get out and about and, and meet as many people as they can during the election campaign. So those, those are two sort of practical type observations. At, at a more sort of macro level, at, 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 the, at looking at the big politics of where the parties are, um, this election is being dominated by basically two things. One is Brexit, mm. uh, and the second one is the the, the the dire showings of the leadership offerings of the two main parties. That seems to be what is what people are talking about in the campaign. Mm. Uh, as someone who has uh, obviously successfully uh, stood for Parliament, how influential do you think? the manifestos of the parties are on ensuring that uh, a candidate standing for election is elected? I, I doubt very much if more than, I don't know, a couple of thousand people across the whole country will have read cover to cover the manifestos of the main parties. It just doesn't happen. Um, but what those manifestos do do is for people who are engaged in public policy making, they're very important. Um, you know, my current day job, you know, it's really important to look through that manifesto in detail mm. to see where our policy areas have got to mention and what was said. So for uh, NGOs, pressure groups, campaigners, they're vital that you've got to mention in the manifesto because it's a way of holding those that get ultimately get elected holding them to account for what they promised in their manifesto. It gives you a bit of leverage, which is, you know, that's the good side of the manifesto. The, the downside is they're so big that Joe Public doesn't really take into account the detail of the manifesto. Hmm. It's more, what are the headlines say? What are the big issues? 
and what is the feel around the ability of the party to actually deliver upon what was promised in the manifesto. So you can make fantastic promises, but if you've got no chance of actually delivering it in government, then frankly people aren't going to vote for you in the same way as if you had a totally unpopular manifesto, um, people aren't going to vote for you either. Mm. So you, when you write your manifesto, you've got to get the balance right between what's deliverable, what's realistic, but also what is, you know, what is positive and what is, uh, what gives people hope and gives them cause to vote for you in the first place. Mm. Uh, now you mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago about the unpopularity of the uh, two main candidates for prime minister. This was perhaps obviously quite different when you uh, were first elected in 1997. Do you think that the individual personality and the character of the leader of one of the main parties is crucial, perhaps above all else, to ensuring that that party is elected? I'm convinced of it. Uh, For the vast majority of votes cast, not all of them, but for the vast majority of votes cast, they're cast on the basis of party loyalty, party affinity that people have, have historically. And there'll be people who will always vote Conservative, full stop. People will always vote Labour or Lib Dem or whatever, full stop. You're not going to influence those. But then the next tranche of people are going to be those that look at the particular leaders. And where there's a popular leader, let's say, you know, Tony Blair at the 1997 election, incredibly popular. Um, And the feel for the Labour Party and the the way in which Tony Blair was viewed in such a positive light was far more important in getting me elected than, than whatever qualities I may or may not have had. I mean, let's be realistic. It, it's at the national picture that the vast majority of votes are cast. Sure, there are going to be some individuals who you meet as uh, as a candidate on the campaign trail that might like what you have said personally about a local issue. Mm. They might know you. They might be a neighbour. You will get some votes that way, but the vast majority are going to be on the basis of the party nationally and the leader. And that's why in this particular general election, there are so many questions being asked by people who participate in the process. They're voters, but frankly, they don't know who to vote for this time. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, because of the the leaders of the two major parties are, um, you know, they're, they're many ways diametrically opposed to each other but equally both have got considerable flaws to their character and that's what's giving people cause for concern. Mm. Uh, I'd now like to uh, move on and just uh, touch upon to begin with the Conservatives manifesto and it was interesting as I was looking at the manifesto today uh, Brexit is mentioned 61 times in the manifesto the phrase get Brexit done is mentioned 23 times but for example, knife crime is only mentioned once. Uh, obesity is only mentioned twice, and I think um, the environment itself is only mentioned 22 times. Do you think that this demonstrates that the Conservatives, when they say that, oh, once we've got Brexit done, we've got plans to vastly improve the country and all this sort of thing, do you think that proves that, in reality, they haven't thought about what they're going to do after Brexit and haven't really planned for what they would do uh, as a government after that? I think it's more to do with the fact that they see Brexit as the defining issue at this election. Mm. And certainly the opinion polls suggest that prior loyalties to a, polit- to a political party seem to have disappeared whilst there is this uncertainty around uh, the UK's position with regard to the EU. So Brexit has redefined where your loyalties lie for this election. Whether it's long term or not, I have generally no idea. But certainly it seems to be defining how you vote. And the Conservatives have taken the decision that 52% of the population voted leave. We haven't left. So 
arguably a large proportion of that block of voters are going to be wanting a resolution. So hence their let's get Brexit done argument. Whereas for the Remainers, and I'll declare now I'm a staunch Remainer, um, but for the Remainers, um, first of all, you've got, you know, more than one party to vote for. So that split loyalty as to who you, who you vote for as a Remainer um, means that actually if you're a conservative strategist, you just go, right, just keep it simple. Just say you're going to get Brexit done because you're appealing A to the bigger block, you know, those that won the referendum. Um, and there is certainly, I think, a sentiment out there, whichever way you voted in the referendum in 2016, people are just fed up with this Brexit. They just want it over and done with. So you're tapping into that mindset. You may have even been a Remainer, but you're so sick of the delay and the, and the, the, the prevarication within Parliament because there's that lack of understanding of what Parliament's trying to do, mm. um, that actually you say, yeah, let's get it done, and then we can concentrate on all the other things. Of course, the reality is this election won't get Brexit done um, if you if the Conservatives are re-elected to form a government, because you might get the transition agreement through by January 2020, but then you've got the whole process of nego negotiating the actual Brexit is still to be done. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's it's a false promise in the manifesto, but there is a degree of appeal there, uh, you know, to 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 a, a certain core block of voters. That said, Will, I have to say, I looked at the, you know, the Conservative Manifesto, and there's some very clever bits in it, um, from a political campaigner's perspective, that is. I'm not saying I support the Manifesto. Just look at it from a, you know, as a campaigning tool. There's some, there's focus on different candidates from different constituencies, and clearly, if you look at it, clearly trying to show what a, a wide, and varied background conservative candidates are from, mm. which I think is quite clever. Um, but also dotted in, there are specific mentions of uh, local campaigning activities. I, I'll give an example. Um, back where you know, near to where my parents live, uh, up in the black country, one of the candidates or, or one of the pledges is to look at reopening Will and All train station. Now, Wollanall hasn't had a trade station since the 1960s, mm. but the Tory MP in that area has been campaigning for it. So to get it included in the manifesto helps that that, that particular candidate um, in their re-election campaign, because they can say it's in the manifesto, there's a mention of it, which is, as I said at the beginning, that's what you want to see in a manifesto, something you can point to to extract leverage over for the next five years. So um, I think the Conservative Manifesto is clever in that it's not particularly detailed. There's not a lot in it. All of the things that you've, that you've highlighted, quite rightly, bread and butter issues don't really get a mention compared to let's get it done, which is the, the stock message that every well-crafted Conservative spokesperson is parroting at the moment. Mm. It's interesting that you mentioned um, the candidates because there was one particular... Uh, candidate picture that quite interested me and it was a picture that they used for uh, Adam Wordsworth who is the uh, Conservative candidate in We the Vale and uh, it has the caption he's a former police officer but shows him in uh, uniform as a police officer now I mean regardless of whether you think that's uh, an appropriate uh, thing to do or not I do think that as you say it's quite a, a, a clever tactic to demonstrate that the um, that the conservative candidates come from such a, a wide uh, background and also perhaps implying that you know oh we are on the side of the police and the and the police are on the side of us yeah absolutely i mean that's what that's what it's done for for deliberate for that reason um so you've got farmers you've got midwives what you know people in the health service uh you know former police officers yeah that's what you want to do as a political party is show how broad your how broad your appeal is, but in particular, you know, yeah, you you know, you you want you know police officers in in effect endorsing you as a political party. Mm. Certainly, as a you know, I put my hand up as a candidate um, when I've produced leaflets as an MP and as a candidate. 
I've included photographs of uh, police officers in them, mm -hmm. uh, where obviously it's been appropriate and they've given permission, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because that's a subliminal message that goes out to the electorate. And it's, you know, it's what has gone on probably for time immemorial. That's the type of messaging that's gone on. Um, as we mentioned, the uh, bread and butter issues and the main subject being uh, get Brexit done, there has also been uh, a bit of um, kerfuffle in the manifesto over the promise of 50,000 new nurses, but then there's the whole uh, retaining 18,500, so 18,500 of them wouldn't be new. Do you think that because the overall message is, you know, get Brexit done, that these sorts of like... Uh, nuances as to the fact that the 50,000 nurses won't be new, 18,000 of them will be retained. Do you think that because the overall message is so prominent, discrepancies like that are just not getting out to the general public as much as they might do in another manifesto? I think this is where we see that times have changed, frankly. Uh, I think in previous manifestos, uh, those sort of details were very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, message discipline, whatever the party you know, is, that's not relevant, but message discipline across the board was important. So you, you, you could not, certainly as a candidate in 1997, running up to the general election, I was not in a position to make promises that I could not absolutely guarantee delivery. And, and that 1997 manifesto that, you know, Labour was so successful on was actually, it was, it was quite limited in its ambition. Mm. In fact, in fact, the argument that we had at the time, it's better to over deliver and under promise than over promise and under deliver. Mm. So we had, you know, a relatively um, unambitious uh, manifesto. But actually, we did more than that when we were in office. The manifestos across the piece at the moment seem to be, you know, so 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 huge in terms of their ambition that actually, when you've had the experience of government, you look and go, well, well, that's just not going to happen. Mm. Let's just not kid ourselves. It's not deliverable. Um, and and the bit I, I must admit, I have a bit of a hobby horse. I I used to teach stats. At, uh, at Worcester, the old Worcester College of Technology. So I, I've got a bit of a beef about the misuse of statistics mm. and the 50,000 nurse, extra nurses uh, promise is, is an exact um, you know, reason why statisticians pull their hair out uh, <laughs> at, at politicians because it's not 50,000 new nurses. There might be 50,000 more nurses than there would have been otherwise. Mm. But that's not a particularly catchy phrase to use. <laughs> uh, and and you know, I have to be honest. In you know, when the coalition government, um, you know, they, they were as guilty as as anybody of making these sort of promises. I remember one because just I just know because of the area of work I, I I I'm in at the moment, where they said energy bills w will be three hundred pounds lower than they would have been otherwise. Well. No, they've gone up. <laughs> but you can't say, well, they're lower than they, they would have been had this, that, and the other happened. Because mm. anybody could say that. Um, so, yeah, the 50,000, I mean, look, they've come unstuck on that number. Does it matter? It should do. In reality, no, it won't. Um, because I don't think the public, uh, I think they've been bombarded with these promises by all of the parties that I just think they're so sceptical about any promise they're made because there are so many of the promises and um, they've just become accustomed to politicians not delivering. Mm. And, and it's, a bit of a myth. it's a bit of a myth. I think there was a study this week that said when looking at manifestos in the UK, it was a, over 80 percent of promises were actually delivered. Mm. And, and I remember my time in government very much that if there was a manifesto commitment you, you would go along and, and tick it to see whether it was still outstanding or not and there was real you know emphasis on delivery particularly in that first term of a Labour government 
with that we had five key pledges and some of them they might have appeared unambitious but they were actually really difficult to do in government and um, a lot of resource went into actually delivering it so that when we faced the electorate in 2001 we could hand on heart say this is what we promised and we delivered it now let us deliver some more mm. uh, genuinely you know this election there is no way some of these commitments are ever going to be met in a five-year term of office it's just impossible and i think that's something that uh, the ifs has raised about both the conservative and uh, labor manifesto and i like to turn to labor's uh, manifesto at the moment there's a lot of great deal of broad commitments to nationalizing uh, royal mail uh, making broadband free, nationalising water, electricity, etc. Do you think that because in some ways uh, the idea of nationalisation, etc. was rolled out in 2017, do you think that the public are not as engaged with Labour's manifesto this time because it's a sense of, oh well, we've already heard this and perhaps we didn't like it? Um, it's interesting that the, the, the Labour manifesto um, and, and some of the, the, the bigger policy offers office that have been made seem, according to polling anyway, seem to be viewed fairly positively. Mm. So I think there is an appetite out there for intervention in economic matters that there wasn't 20 years ago. So I, th mm. I think, you know, that, that, that would be my take. I think there's, there's, there's genuine interest amongst the, the public at large because they see an unfairness in, uh, in society that needs to be addressed. And this is a way in which that unfairness can be dealt with. This mm -hmm. is, this is how the, the, the message is being put over. Um, so, you know, running the, you know, the water companies and the energy companies for the national good sounds a really you know positive prospect you go mm. oh, yeah thank, we'll, we'll have that thank you very much if you just twisted it a bit as, as i know some of the polling has been done and say do you want state-run broadband people go oh, blow me no because the state couldn't organize anything and, and and you know do you want it run from whitehall Oh, no, thank you. I don't want civil servants running the, the broadband or your, your energy system. Mm. Um, and that's the difficulty. People have got, a, in effect, a view of that they know something's wrong. And at the moment, this is the only offer that's being made to, to do something about it. Mm. Uh, actually, you know, if you were to, to, to you know, look at sort of uh, a, a more sort of social democratic argument, it would be yeah we accept there's something wrong but you don't have to own all of the assets to put it right mm. you just manage it better you just have better regulation you don't need to own the asset to regulate it because mm. that's not what makes a system be it a train operator or an energy company work in favor of the consumer it's it's how you control it so i i, I did smile um this week when i saw one of the left-wing bloggers complaining about the service that, that he had received on uh, one of the transport operators, LNER. Mm. LNER is state-owned. It's state-run. <laughs> In effect, it's a nationalised train operator. And still the service was poor because of bad management. Mm. And fundamentally, that's, that, that's what you have to grapple with. And yes, that needs resource. Uh, it needs good managers. It needs to be well-resourced. It might need more taxes to pay for. All of those things are a given. And there might be an argument ethically about the need to intervene in the sort of economic circumstances that we find ourselves in now compared to where we were 20 years ago. But there are some that argue, but owning the asset is just going to make matters worse, not better. Hmm. Do you think that, uh, in part, this perhaps desire to support things being uh, run properly and uh, perhaps maybe not run by the state but uh, 
engaging with nationalisation in a way that um, we haven't seen for a long time. It's partly a reaction to a sense that the government at the moment are holding responsibility for actually running things. You know, we've seen uh, the government over the past nine years um, uh, send out uh, security rather than allowing the police, for example, to uh, police the Olympic Games. They handed out a contract to G4S and then they had to get the police in because they uh, weren't handling it uh particularly well at the time and similarly with um, academy chains where academy chains have been handed out and then the schools have not been run properly and we've had to see uh, the state intervene again do you think this is a reaction against a, a, a lack of conservative responsibility and that's what's driving it perhaps more than a desire for nationalization it's a good question i i, I genuinely am uncertain on that front because for every case that you could mention of a of an academy school chain that hadn't succeeded, um, the supporters of, of academy chains would would point to successful academies that have turned around failing schools that were under quote state ownership or local authority control. So I've always, you know, for a long time believed that that actually it's not who owns it. It's how it's run that matters. You can have fantastic schools in in local authority run structures, brilliant schools. You can have brilliant private sector schools. Um, you know, academy change can be fantastic, um, but you can also have dire schools in, in both. Mm. And and it's again, it come back to that point. It's not necessarily the the, the ownership. It's the leadership. So you go into any school and what determines how well a school does is usually the direction of travel set by the by the head teacher and the leadership team mm. and delivered by the staff in the school. And that is true of, you know, it could be a, you know, a company that provides train operator services. It could be a company that provides, um, you know, your, your water. Um, I mean, there are some water companies that are not for profit, mm. but they're still going to be nationalised. Well, you know, what's the point of that? You know, why would you nationalise a company that is set, that it's that it's dedicated and set up as a not-for-profit enterprise? Surely that's a good thing if you believe in the, that sort of state regulation and state ownership. Um, you don't want profits being made and payments to dividend the dividends to shareholders. That's the argument that's always put out there. But a not-for-profit does all of that. But it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be state-owned and not-for-profit. Mm. Uh, I'd just like to now uh, briefly touch upon uh, the Lib Dem manifesto. And one of the, uh, aside from revoking Article 50, one of the uh, policies in the manifesto that has caught quite a few people's uh, attention is the Lib Dem skills wallet, which is, uh, they uh, suggest if they form the government or in some part of the government that they would hand out certain amounts of money uh, to provide for adult education at different stages of people's lives. Um, how effective do you think this would be as a policy? I think as an ambition, it's, it's, it's worthy. Mm. I think there's a lot of merit in actually saying to uh, you know, workers, look, you're not going to be doing the same job for the rest of your life. We know that our economy doesn't operate that way. Mm. There will be times when you need to reskill and upskill, and so we are going to equip you all with the resource to enable you to do that. I think that's a very powerful message. It deals with the productivity gap that we have in the UK, and actually, it should be one that raises ambition amongst all of the workforce uh, along the lines of the sort of lifelong learning agenda that. Ironically, Labour champion back in the late 1990s. Mm. Um, the experience of the Labour government, we tried something very similar with something known as individual learning accounts, mm. which for some worked incredibly well. But unfortunately, there were people who abused the system and there was a degree of fraud that was committed mm. and, and, and the scheme fell apart as a, as a result of people abusing the system. And um, and so that's my 
sort of question mark over the skills wallet. I like the idea. I think it's the right thing to try and address. Um, but I'm, you know, again, it's always those harsh lessons that you learn in government that come back to haunt you. That suggest you've got to make sure this is done properly. You've got to have it sufficiently flexible to reach everybody that you want to reach. But you can't have the system so flexible that it can be abused. Hmm. So it's the, for me, the question is about the practicality. But that ambition of, of approaching the, the sort of 50 percent of the school population that don't go on to university, I actually think is probably more pressing than arguing for um, free tuition fees. Mm. Um, I think the need is far more pressing amongst that group of individuals than it is for students at university to have free tuition. Uh, well, we're coming up to the end of the podcast. It's been uh, great to have you on, Michael. It's been a fantastic discussion. Uh, thanks once again for, for coming on. Uh, and I'd just like to ask you one final question. Uh, we're coming up towards Christmas. We're into uh, December now, so I would like to ask you, what would you like for Christmas? <laughs> well, that's a good question. It's a, it's, a pretty, it's a question my kids ask me as well, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and so I, uh, you know, I can reply to them quite easily. Um, actually, in a political world, what would I like for Christmas? Um, you know, I'd like to see a Labour government mm-hmm. for Christmas. Uh, absolutely. Um, would it be a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn? Probably not. No. But I'd like to see a good Labour government. Well, I think that's uh, I, that's a uh, something that I can certainly agree with, and I think uh, quite a few uh, of our listeners will agree with too. Thank you again for coming on the podcast, Michael. Pleasure, no problem at all. Uh, if you would like to uh, listen to the podcast, you can do so on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, and YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook at Debated Podcast. If you'd like to send us an email, you can do uh, at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope you listen to the next one. 